So thanks very much, Claire, for um, giving a little bit of guidance to your speakers. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that they will be doing fine. And uh, now, actually, it's uh, 10 past um, 3 p.m., so we need to start. Uh, I wish to now uh, say a very, very warm welcome to Claire May, who will be uh, chairing uh, the session on science diplomacy, a new way of thinking about your role in a community of research. Thanks, Claire. And now the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stella. Thanks for everything you've done. Welcome, everyone, uh, to the science diplomacy session. Uh, it's, uh, we're hoping to, to get you to th think in a new way today about your role in an international community of, of research. And I'd like to thank uh, my nano project, Sabina, and my coordinator and work package leader at LETAT, who've supported me in this uh, organization, but also another project in another cluster, a project called INSIDE, which is uh, uh, inventing a shared science diplomacy for Europe. Uh, coordinated at the Sorbonne here in Paris. And uh, I am, am so happy that uh, this uh, cluster membership has uh, let me meet these wonderful science diplomats like uh, Lorenzo, who will be speaking, or, or Guillermo. Um, I've been, I'm a social psychologist and I've been working for 10 years in uh, the nano safety cluster in different projects, nano fate, nano phase, coordinated by Klaus Svensson from CEH in Wallingford in the UK. And uh, my work there has been uh, what we call translational work. Uh, that is to say, uh, helping to translate uh, results in environmental modeling, uh, nano ecotoxicological results, translate them uh, to help them get across various borders, disciplinary borders, stakeholder group borders. And I have to say that uh, my colleagues in nano-fate and nano-phase have been incredibly good and very inspiring at this kind of border crossing work. Um, the nano-safety uh, cluster, one of the very interesting and um, intriguing things for me during the time that I've worked with the, the colleagues is the idea of these communities of research and also specific missions in which nanoscientists, nano safety scientists have been recruited essentially by the uh, European Commission to go on missions to, for example, Mexico or Iran uh, to, to, you know, build up uh, scientific exchange and, and uh, understanding. And now I see on our wonderful new nano safety cluster site that Tassos has created that there's a real formalization of uh, this story uh, in terms of nano EU nano safety delegations. Now this language here, which I've um, abstracted from uh, this page in the um, in the nano safety cluster website, is a really interesting page for me now that I've learned something about science diplomacy. We see that uh, the NSC sees itself as really cooperating with the European Union to develop and sustain links of all kinds, not just scientific links, but using scientific cooperation as a vehicle to develop and sustain different kinds of links. And one of the main overarching goals would be to raise awareness amongst the scientific community in third countries on EU values, visions, and priorities. And uh, this page also mentions uh, specific um, entities within uh, the European Union. The European External Action Service, which is Euro Europe's foreign ministry, if you will, uh, and the European Commission, which we all know, to build relevant, ambitious and genuine relations with third countries. So I think that uh, today is a, a good time to talk with practitioners and um, and uh, learn about how people have become involved in what is perhaps a little bit more than your typical scientific cooperation. I'd like us to reflect today and uh, the practitioners and, and, uh, and researchers who are joining us uh, will help us think today about what does it mean to, to step out of a pure scientist role, if such exists, into some kind of international relations, some kind of translation, translational role also, trying to communicate values and perhaps change the way people and 
political structures in other countries are dealing with our own context. Uh, Stella, can you jump down? If you want to learn more about uh, science diplomacy, uh, my wonderful sister project within the European Science Diplomacy Cluster, S4D4C, has uh, made a great video. Uh, they are running a wonderful online course that uh, Lorenza will tell you about in, in a minute. And inside my own project, we'll do our second edition of a science diplomacy school next June. Uh, and this I'm showing here the, um, the sort of brochure, which is on the Sabina site under news. Let's have the last slide so that we can go immediately now to an initiation to science diplomacy by Lorenza Melchor. Go for it. Lorenzo, thank you for, for being with us. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, NanoSafe 2020. Uh, thank you all attendees for this initiation to science diplomacy or for this workshop on science diplomacy. I've got the hard task to introduce you what science diplomacy is in just under 15 minutes. So I'll do my best to uh, just to uh, show you certain ideas uh, to give you an overview. My name is Lorenzo Melchor, and I work at the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology as an EU Science Advice and Diplomacy Officer, directly involved in the project S4 D4C. Next slide. Stella. We live in a world that is facing global challenges. Climate change, aging, global health, uh, sustainable cities, migration, pandemic, mm, also income inequality or the battle of two superpowers such as the United States of China or the crisis of democracy. This is my experience. And we are living in a moment where COVID-19 is such a global challenge. It has taken shape uh, and we have a virus being spread all across the world and putting our uh, welfare states at risk, not only on the health system, but also on the economic system. We are seeing that science is taking a predominant role in everything, but putting policy making in place with science advice, we can see that it also has its frictions worldwide. And lastly, the development of a vaccine is, uh, is an exercise that uh, goes beyond cooperation to the realm of competition between countries or between big pharma to produce such a vaccine. There are, this is a complex topic, COVID-19, with many different angles. Next slide. Yeah. So for the last 40 years, globalization and interdependence, and especially digital revolution, has greatly affected science and diplomacy in many different ways. But if we were are to tackle global challenges, uh, we need to invest in science and technology because uh, most of those global challenges I explained before are a scientific or technological solution, but they require the agreement of many different countries to put in place policies that will tackle those global challenges using those scientific and technical solutions. So we require an exercise of science diplomacy. Next slide. And this is important because science, technology, and innovation are getting increasingly important or key in international affairs. Science and diplomacy are talking to each other now more than ever because science is a source of economic development and competitiveness because uh, scientific cooperation drives international cooperation, but also because the impact of big tech, global uh, cities and tech clusters are changing the way diplomacy was traditionally undertaken by, by nation states to different governance levels or different actors beyond the state actor. Next slide. But science has been used, not now, but before, as an instrument of soft power. We can witness different uh, uh, science and technology agreements between countries that were in principle enemies or not allies, like the US and the United States and the, the communist Russia. 
Also, the establishment of large scientific infrastructures here in uh, Europe with CERN, but also in the Middle East with Sesame, and many different uh, big endeavors like uh, space exploration. Next slide. But we need to tackle one issue. Science and diplomacy are two different worlds with two different kinds of professionals. Scientists and diplomats are belong to two different worlds. They do have different interests, norms, attitude. So how we combine them? Uh, Daryl Copeland says scientists and diplomats are two strange bedfellows. Next slide. So this is why we, uh, like in 2010, uh, the world is starting putting a lot of attention on science diplomacy. And for you to understand, there is not a single definition of science diplomacy or a single understanding of science diplomacy. Different actors understand this world in different ways. You may find some uh, useful uh, definitions in this seminar paper in the Royal Society and the AAAS, or another paper by Tim Plink and Nicholas Ruffin. But next slide. A couple of years ago, uh, the Madrid Declaration on Science Diplomacy was released uh, as part of our s Diplomacy project. And in there, we approach science diplomacy with a very single or simple definition. Science diplomacy understood as a series of practices that are at the intersection of science, technology, innovation, with foreign policy and diplomacy. Everything that has to do with bringing together all these complex topics. Next slide. The different conceptual approaches that were uh, put forward by the seminal policy paper in 2010 are this one. Like science in diplomacy, putting scientific knowledge in diplomacy agreements or in, the, in diplomacy negotiations. Like, the scientific uh, advice that is present every year uh, with the climate change summit is one example another approach is diplomacy for science is uh, putting in contact different countries together to put money and resources and uh, talent for some mission or some uh, approach that no one country can do it by uh, by itself because it's too expensive, like space exploration or uh, many other different projects, it involves putting many countries together to uh, do this scientific endeavor. And the last, science for diplomacy, is an approach in which uh, where when you have two countries that don't cooperate with each other because they are enemies or they don't have a nice relationship, you may start putting in place scientific collaborations as a way for improving diplomatic relationships between countries. We saw this especially with the uh, Obama administration of the United States and Cuba, for instance, in regards to uh, the forecast of weather because a hurricane or a tornado that uh, arises in the Caribbean will affect Cuba and uh, the United States regardless of their economic or political systems. Next slide. One important issue in science diplomacy is that uh, the stakeholders that are involved. Uh, traditionally, we are talking in diplomacy about governmental stakeholders and nation states, but they are not the only players in science diplomacy. We have intergovernmental and supranational bodies, like for instance, the United Nations, but we also have the research and academic sector. Universities, large research centers, and uh, other type of uh, research-related institutions are getting a predominant role in international affairs. Private sector with multinationals and SMEs are also a growing key actor in diplomacy in general. And lastly, organized civil society like national or transnational NGOs, but also private charities and patrons and activists are an increasing player in everything related to diplomacy and also with science diplomacy. Next slide. But okay, uh, national networks and national country or state and nation states are a predominant player. And uh, certain countries deploy strategies to allocate or employ scientists 
at their embassies abroad. They would be like the science delegates to represent their national and national uh, science and technology systems abroad in order to build up scientific collaborations or to also to drive competitiveness of their national country. The UK Science and Innovation Network, for instance, has a network of 110 delegates abroad, whereas the Swissness Network employs around 70 people to work in 30 different countries. Next slide. And also we can discuss about regional approaches. There are areas like uh, the Arctic or the Antarctic or the Mediterranean or the Middle East that they are areas that transcends borders and they are not just a matter of one single country, but there are many that are involved. How do we liaise with scientific uh, topics of interest in those regional approaches? How these countries cooperate with each other or compete with each other under uh, these uh, frameworks. For instance, PRIMA is a, a funding framework to develop a research projects related to water and energy sustainability and food security in the Mediterranean area, bringing together countries from the northern Mediterranean and the southern Mediterranean, building capacities uh, in both sides and building collaborative projects. The mission in the Antarctic is a nice one as well. How a space that is, uh, is uh, it doesn't belong to any particular country, and it's a very uh, hazard place to undertake research. How uh, all these countries got together to actually explore this place and collaborate. Next slide. And global approaches, uh, well, we have a very good successful example in science diplomacy that is uh, usually mentioned, and it's the fact of the awesome hole and how it got uh, fixed uh, with uh, the effort from the scientific uh, community, providing uh, evidence that uh, all the ozone layer was uh, getting extinguished in certain parts, and how this triggered a very aggressive uh, negotiation at the level of the United Nations for all countries to accept certain regulations. And now the uh, ozone hole uh, is, uh, is much better than before. Lastly, in the United Nations in, the, in 2015, uh, the COP agreement in Paris uh, was reached. And also all the agenda of the 17 SDGs is another success story of how science diplomacy can be framed to tackle global challenges. Next slide. So understood what is science diplomacy, let's understand who is the, uh, who are the people who do, do science diplomacy, or who are these science diplomats. In a paper that uh, I had the pleasure to publish recently in the Hague Journal of Diplomacy, I elaborated this definition, or this wide definition, meaning that science diplomats would be all those professionals, be they scientists or diplomats, who work to place STI affairs as an important dimension between international relations and the international policy system. Of course, we can have scientists who uh, they do research and their mandate is to do research, and from time to time they may engage in diplomatic negotiations as a scientific advisor. Those would be the diplomat scientists. Or we could have diplomats uh, at the embassies who have the portfolio of uh, science, technology, and innovation. Those would be the scientist diplomats. But before, or besides these two very strict professionals, we can have in the middle additional profiles of mediators or knowledge brokers, people with a scientific background that aren't undertaking research anymore, but they are working in international organizations or in governmental departments to facilitate the collaboration and the connectivity between diplomats and scientists. Next slide. These science diplomats, regardless whether they are scientists or diplomats, they need to have a set of boundary spanning skills. They need to understand the world of science and the world of diplomacy and build bridges between the two of them. 
That's why they need to have cultural dexterity, a lot of networking and interpersonal skills, communication skills, storytelling, and many other traits that are uh, shown in this slide. Next slide, please. In the paper that I mentioned before, in the Hague Journal of Diplomacy, we uh, elaborated a taxonomy of different science diplomat profiles. Some of them will be institutionalized positions, like people working at embassies, uh, national representation abroad, uh, international or intergovernmental departments, or even in mean national ministers. They would have like the specific portfolio representing science diplomacy. But we can also have non-institutionalized positions in a kind of a conceptual stretch definition of science diplomacy to refer to uh, all those policy officers, even researchers, who work not in a state actors, uh, but in other sectors, and who from time to time, historically, may affect international relations and international affairs. Next slide. However, there are certain challenges and recommendations. There is not a clear career path uh, in science diplomacy. There is the requirement of additional training and experience. Science is just one piece in the global puzzle of international affairs, and you need to nurture your communication and networking skills. Last slide is just to recommend you that uh, this has 44 c European Science Diplomacy online course delves on many of the topics that I introduced in this 15 minutes talk. It's a free online course that you can take at your own pace, and more than 5,000 people are already taking this course. Next slide. Just to simplify that science diplomacy involves scientific advice, international diplomacy, science cooperation, and many different actors that may work at government, but also at non-governmental stakeholders. The last slide only gives us gives away my contact details. And sorry for the two minutes left. Great job, Florenza. Thank you so much. Uh, people, I hope that that has kind of uh, intrigued you and, and uh, gotten your curiosity. Maybe you've already started thinking about how you yourself uh, as a scientist um, uh, place yourself in regard to addressing global challenges. You're not just working in your lab, you're trying to contribute to well-being and to, to planetary uh, future, shall we say. Um, perhaps when you use uh, scientific equipment, large equipment in another country, you'll understand now if, if it wasn't sort of one of the main things you thought of before, you'll understand that that's a regional or, or global level uh, approach to, to science cooperation, which may have various uh, rationales behind it. But how about the national approach? First of all, I should say that Lorenzo himself spent a long time in, in London uh, doing science diplomacy and developing it. And we're going to hear now from uh, Guillermo Orts, who also uh, is a nanoscientist, Lorenzo is not, um, uh, uh, Guillermo will tell us about uh, how a nanoscientist uh, found himself in diplomatic service and what that has meant. I'd just like to mention before Guillermo starts that you can, um, uh, we're going to have breakout groups, of course, so that you can discuss more deeply with our uh, speakers. And um, meanwhile, we'll have a few minutes for questions after Guillermo's talk, so you could put a few questions into um into the the chat. Guillermo, I see a, a message from you you cannot hear. Is that all right now? Um, Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I hear. Yes, I hear. Yeah, can you okay. hear me? Yes, go ahead now, Guillermo. <laughs> go ahead. Because uh, in communication, we said the first mistake in communication is to assume that communication has taken place. <laughs> So, uh, I apologize, I, I could not hear the introduction by you, Claire, but uh, if I'm right, you can hear me. So We I can, can hear you. Perfect. Thank you very much. So, and thank you for the introduction and the invitation. And first of all, I would like to say hello, not only to, to Claire, but to everyone here. I can see your names, Adrian, Antonio, Claire, Agnes, Cristina, Clarissa, Christophe. Brother Christina, Ilaria, Constantinos, Caxo, Ninke, Paul, Steffi, Sean, Tassos, and Jarkin. 
this is wonderful. I can see your names because this is important that you know to whom are you speaking to. So um, my name is Guillermo Orgil and uh, I'm a scientist by training, but uh, I had some experience in my career and I would like to, to share with you my, my story, my personal story. And uh, so the title of the, of the talk is uh, Nanoscientist in Diplomatic Service. But uh, I decided to change the title because I like to change titles. And if you go to the next slide, please. Yeah, the title could also be how I got here and what I learned on the way. And this is more, more accurate, maybe, according to, to my story. And uh, the story is uh, as it follows. If you go to the next slide, please. So this is my man and this is my dad. My dad looking through the microscope and my mom having some fun at the lab. So I come from a family of chemists, but uh, to be honest, I never, I never uh, had the feeling that was the only opportunity in life. Um, actually, when I was a child, my, my dad and my mom already quit uh, doing science. So I, I knew my father and my mother, not as a scientist, but doing other jobs. And uh, I found these pictures many years uh, afterwards, and uh, it helps me to illustrate that uh, science is an important part of life, but it's not the only part of life. And uh, I remember I went with my father to look for some paintings, some very old paintings. You can see me on, on the wall here looking for, for old paintings in Spain. You know, we have these caves and, and these nice places, no? very, very old. And uh, when I was a child, I, I didn't see my dad with a lab coat or my mom, but they, they, they told me nice, nicely that science was an important part of life, but not the only one. So if we go to the next slide, please. So many years after this, these pictures, um, by the way, the, the, the pictures in black and white were taken in Barcelona in 1955, I think, okay? And many years later, um, it was me. This is me and my colleagues at the Max Planck Society where I was working for, for several years. Um, actually, all my uh, scientific career was, um, was in Germany where I did my PhD in physical chemistry and then I was working on, on nano and uh, also nanotoxicology at the Federal Institute for Material Research and then at the Max Planck Society. And uh, why, why, why I'm showing you this? Because I think many of you are scientists, probably most of you. So I know quite well how do you feel and uh, how do you think maybe and uh, the experience to be in a lab and to work and doing experiments and writing papers and all this stuff which is, which is very nice and is a very nice part of, or it was a very nice part of my life. But if we go to the next um, to the next slide, yes, this is also me, and it was more or less at the same year as the previous uh, picture. But here I started something new. I start doing things outside the lab. Um, actually, I started doing communication activities, and it was writing in blogs, writing for 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 a journal about um, science and nano and so on. And at that time, I also started working um, as a head of communications of a very special, let's say, institution, which uh, it was called SERFA. It was an association of scientists. And I have, I, I'm so thankful to this association. I'm so, thank, so thankful to SERFA uh, because they, they transmit me, they, they teach me. Uh, the need and the importance to see science also like this, to see science in color, to see science uh, as important part of life and uh, uh, to see science also outside the lab. So uh, since this year, these years at, uh, at the Max Planck Society, working with very, very good scientists and also combining this with my part-time job, let's say, at this association of scientists um, working in communication, I, I, I really develop a, a love or a sense for, for aesthetic and, and, and 
and also a couple of things I, I will tell you later, maybe in the next slide. So, um, science, arts, communication. I, I, I had all these those ingredients in my life, uh, but in 2015, um, I read about an opportunity, and the opportunity was to join an embassy, an embassy in Berlin, and to work, and to work in an embassy in Berlin. And I thought at the beginning, okay, it sounds interesting, it sounds really to go out of the box, and uh, they need a scientist, or someone who, who knows very well science, and who knows very well Germany, and at that time I was living already for, I think, 12 years in Germany, and uh, knew the country very well and uh, the science system. And they offered me a position at the embassy of Spain in Germany. And I was thinking a little bit about this. And at the end, I, I made my research and in internet. And also I visit a, a Max Planck a Center for the History of Science. And I found this guy, the, the story of this guy. And this is apparently the first science diplomat. And uh, yeah, it was inspiring for me because you see this guy is sitting close to a microscope uh, in the same way my father did, in the same way my mother did, and in the same way I spent many years working with microscopes, with electron microscopes. So I thought, okay, it's interesting. If this guy was doing this, and it was the first science diplomat, it was in 1898. 1898. It was the, the US embassy in Berlin. So I was, I got inspired by this guy and I said to myself, okay, let's give a chance, let's try, why not? So I start working in an embassy. And uh, in the next slides, I'm, I'm gonna try to tell you my experience with this. So very shortly, I have a few slides and a couple of messages. One of the important messages is this one. Um, science diplomacy is about relations. Science is also about relations. Every activity is about relations at the end, but diplomacy and science diplomacy too uh, is about relations. So uh, I attend so many events, conferences. I invite people to the embassy. I went to other embassies. I'm here with uh, this guy on the left is the president of the Max Planck Society. And uh, right uh, on the right, you can see the, the president of the Nobel Foundation. And uh, in the middle, you can see the, the only Spanish astronaut who is now a Minister of Science and Innovation in Spain. And uh, on the right down, you can see the president of the European Research Council. And of course, I, I met these people and many other interesting people, uh, sometimes not famous, but so interesting. And so I learned relations are very, very, very important. Okay, you can be the best scientist, you can be the best um, professional in your field, but if you don't work properly in your relations, um, you are missing something. And this is the first thing I learned, okay? If we can please, Stella, go to the next slide. So the second thing I learned after some months was to try to translate these relations, these events, this let's say diplomatic environment with something you can touch, with something you can give value or can give value to someone. And I think this is the point, okay? Uh, I think many people have a negative concept of diplomacy and uh, sometimes partially they are right because if you are only doing relations all the time and you don't have a concrete goal, then it's only good for you. It's only good maybe for you your embassy is maybe good for a little bit for your country, but you have to add value. And with science diplomacy, you can add value, create something, okay? So at uh, that time I learned, after so many meetings and events and, uh, and meeting nice people, that it's important to, in science diplomacy, try to find some needs, identify needs, and then try to contribute to the solutions, okay? and uh, also to promote synergies, because sometimes it's not an issue of what you can do or what you know, but to put person A and person B in contact with a concrete goal, 
you can see here a group of people on the left side down and uh, there were doctors uh, working in Germany and doctors working in Barcelona and uh, they had the same goal but they never met so I, I, I tried to, to, to arrange an event and we, we, we really did it and uh, then they start working on CAR T, CAR -T technology, CAR T therapies for cancer or against cancer okay and the last one is create value and value can be in training, training people in relations training people, uh, let's say, education. I visit many schools, I visit uh, high schools, and uh, I spend three years in an embassy, and I make a list after the three years, and uh, we promote with this position uh, 52 actions, 52 actions. And I always try that the actions had some value, okay? Not to then only at the relations level, but try to focus these relations, trying to create some value. So next slide, please. I, I don't I don't know how much time do, do I know? Can, can please anyone right here? How many minutes do I have in the chat? Four minutes. Four minutes. Ah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claire. So I have four minutes. It's more than enough. So after that, after my three years at the embassy, and also during this time. Uh, I further developed my skills as a communicator, and uh, I was writing for, for, for magazines, I was working for a TV show, uh, I was working uh, doing radio, podcasts, every kind of communication form, and that was a very good training for me. And now comes the end of the story. So from science to diplomacy, international relations, communication. So. If you go, please, Stella, to the next slide. This is the place I am. This is the place I, I wanted to be. And luckily, I, I, I achieved to come here. I achieved to come to IBEC. This is the Institute for Bioengineering of Catalonia. And we have a slogan. And the slogan is Bioengineering Solutions for Health. OK? And uh, I'm acting here as a head of communications and public relations. So why I decide to come to, to IBEC? First, because it's Barcelona, it was my hometown, it's my hometown. And because I can combine at IBEC, at this position, all the things I love. And I learn science, solution, communication, international relations, and health. So for me, science diplomacy was a part of my life. And I think it has intrinsic and extrinsic uh, values. You can explode, you can use, and it is good, uh, as Lorenzo said, to trade some training maybe with this uh, offer they uh, he's making to you and I encourage to, to also take part of the course and to know more about science diplomacy and okay I hope you enjoy uh, the story and if you have questions please this is this is me again and this is my my email uh, if you want to write me or to ask me directly now it's my pleasure thank you very much great thank you so much Guillermo uh, I see that we have a question from uh, Janice, mm -hmm. uh, who is part of our Warsaw Science Diplomacy School. We have another one from Tassos. Oh, no, that's the old one from the last session. You don't have to answer this one, Guillermo. Uh, um, uh, let me say also to all of the participants that uh, I think that Lorenzo would be happy to, to reply to questions as well. We have about 10 minutes for this. Uh, Guillermo, what's your response to, to Janice? Uh well, uh, let's say my my background, my training as a scientist, I would say, not only at that nano, okay, uh, it brought me so many, opened me so many windows, so many opportunities, because uh, I think Lorenzo put it on the slide very nicely, okay? You are uh, analytical thing oriented, you are oriented to understand complex things, you are, you, you have your tools. As a scientist, you have your tools and you have your tools with you. And specifically to be a nanoscientist, nanoscientist. Well, uh, we organized many events about nanotechnology. For instance, we brought uh, the falling wall, falling walls competition from Berlin to Barcelona, and we organized this pitch competition in Barcelona. And people from ICFO, from from other institutes, applied for the pitch. And the people who were winning this competition, they they got a very nice trip. Everything paid to Berlin. 
to take part in the international uh, competition of falling wall. Okay, and this is an example. And they came into the news, and the guy who won, it was a, a guy from Turkey working in Barcelona. It was good for the Spanish institution. It was good for the scientists. It was good for the embassy. It was good for falling walls. So uh, being a nanoscientist helped me in such kind of, of things and always trying to, to look for the win-win or nano-win, if you like. Hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to comment uh, that uh, uh, maybe our participants can can be thinking about uh, these these uh, great synergies that you've uh, spoken of, uh, Guillermo, that you've been able to, yeah. to trigger. And uh, I'm wondering about uh, um, uh, your, your, your um, speech was so personal and I want to encourage our participants also to take a really personal uh, look inside and think about the things that make you love to be a scientist and think about the things that uh, make you very good at being a scientist. You know, this analytical thought or this intellectual stamina or this ability to see both the details and a huge picture this ability to, to collaborate and, um, and think about whether you also uh, like to make not only scientific understanding and solutions to, to scientific problems happen, do you also like to make relationships happen? Do you also like to make synergies happen? Do you like to, to see really big things coming together because of your effort? So that I think is part of uh, what we're trying to, to touch on in this science diplomacy um, uh, uh, training today. How about some more questions? I think that there are some more that are being typed up and maybe Lorenzo, while we wait, you can just make a comment. Yeah. Uh, in order to answer to Jennings, uh, I mean, uh, Guillermo has already uh, said uh, a lot, but um, we wouldn't like you to go back to your uh, research uh, bench uh, thinking that we are asking you to leave and to quit academia, okay? We believe that the scientist of the 21st or, or even the 22nd century must be a scientist who undertakes very excellent research but understand that their research should have an impact or a policy impact in society. So, uh, as a nanotechnologist or a nanoscientist, part of your research, surely uh, there are people discussing at the European Union level or at the United Nations level about the limits of your research or the impact of your research or etc. You should make uh, aware, you should be aware that those conversations are ongoing. And if they aren't ongoing, you should foster those discussions, okay? But in that role, you are still a researcher. There are other roles in which, for instance, the one that uh, Guillermo and I had the pleasure to, uh, to perform in the embassies of Spain abroad, where you stop being an expert, being a nanoscientist to become a specialist of almost everything. You need to understand how research is undertaken you will not be talking about nanoscience in particular. From time to time, you will be sitting in a table talking about uh, clim uh, climate change or health, uh, and you know nothing about that. But you are familiar, uh, you are a PhD, and you are familiar with how research is uh, conducted. So you know where to find the right experts that you will invite or that you will give a, a phone call to get familiarized with those topics. That's why a PhD in any of these uh, scientific fields is welcomed to perform in the science diplomacy uh, field. Mm -hmm. Yes, and Lorenzo is addressing himself to uh, the majority in our audience uh, who are of uh, scientific uh, background or activities today. But we also have in our audience uh, uh, people um, from, from other disciplines who are coming at this from the diplomatic side, and you'll be able to, to chat with them in, in, the, um, in the breakout groups. Uh, and that, those are cases when uh, uh, science attaches who may have uh, training in history or English or, or uh, economics suddenly have to become great experts of how to bring people together to, to find scientific solutions in an international relations setting. Okay, we have a question from Neil Hunt now. 
um, uh, Guillermo. Good question. <laughs> yeah. Right now, um, well, I, I'm going to refer in 30 seconds what, what I was doing during my time at the embassy and now, maybe. Um, when you come out of a pure academic uh, institution, uh, it can happen many times that you start interacting with dif different kind of people. And many times these people um, can be from industry, for instance, okay? And to be in touch with diplomats is more common when, when you work um, in an embassy. But a couple of weeks ago, we, we had uh, the opportunity to present IBEC or Institute uh, during a science diplomacy breakfast, okay, in, in, in Brussels. Well, and uh, now is, everything is virtual, but uh, we were more or less in, in Brussels too. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you have to use another approach. So every, every professional um, field has a different language and they have more than the language are the interests. So you need to know what the, what's the interest of the people you are talking to. Okay, and this is the most important thing. And the second thing is you have to be really uh, confident and clear what's your message. Okay, and uh, if you are able to transmit your message, you maybe will achieve your goal. And uh, it's independently if it's industry or our diplomats. But you have to take into consideration that diplomats probably they are less risk oriented, as Lorenzo mentioned. So they want probably to just build up relations. If you go to industry, they want to sign contracts and, and to make money. And uh, yeah, of course, the ones you come out of an ac pure academic institution or even in an academic institution, you start, you also will, will do probably, uh, Neil, you will start interacting with these um, stakeholders and people and uh, yeah, it makes fun too. Yeah, um, Neil and, and everybody, uh, our practitioners uh, here in this part of our workshop uh, had very institutionalized roles. As Lorenzo pointed out, obviously science diplomats are not only the people who are in the embassies. And so uh, the, the, this question of um, uh, different language, different interests, different values, it's part of what Agnieszka has uh, put into her question. I think, uh, Stella, you're going to have to uh, scroll down a little bit for us. And I also want to mention that it will be specifically addressed in our panel in a few minutes by Rasmus Bertelsen and probably in the breakout uh, that uh, Guillermo and Rasmus will share. So, uh, oh, I guess that we can each uh, scroll down ourselves to see the end of Agnieszka's yes. question. Communication becomes challenging without a shared ground of values. What would you advise to meet such challenges using science diplomacy? In just a minute. Or... <laughs> okay. I think, Agnes, you can find the, the answer by yourself, and I can tell you about my experience. But if you uh, are a scientist and you speak to your mother or grandmother, probably you will face some of the similar uh, challenges you face when you, as a scientist, speak to a diplomat. Why? Because dear, these people are not scientists, okay? So if you are a science diplomat, uh, of course, you will face challenges. The point is to build up relationships, you need to find the common values and you uh, make it very clear in your question and you make it very well. So you have to find the shared values and interests, okay? And if you are able to, to do that, um, you can create a relationship and you can, you can, you can really achieve a win-win. And uh, it's not easy, but you have to be, yeah, you have to prepare your meeting, yeah, to know who is this person, what the interest, what the values. Maybe a diplomat knows nothing about science, but maybe the son or the daughter um, has a disease or maybe has uh, interest for astrophysics or the stars or whatever. You have to find a common um, interest or value or something in common and then build up the relationship. Before that, you have to speak and speak and, and, and listen. Listen. Yeah, to elaborate, yeah, to elaborate on this, uh, 
Guillermo and I have been lucky because, I mean, we were deployed to the uh, Spanish embassies in Berlin and in London. So basically, uh, Western values, West, Western uh, culture, uh, a different situation would have been uh, if we had been deployed, I'm not sure, to Russia, Iran or, or any other country who doesn't or have the same Western values and so forth. And in that regard, I mean, diplomacy skills are mandatory and uh, we would have requ been required to operate next to a diplomat 24-7 uh, because they are the ones so fully me, trained. Lorenzo, to... I have the technical problem, I cannot hear Lorenzo. I guess cool. Lorenzo is, is answering the question, yeah? Or commenting yeah. on this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Guillermo, we hear you. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, basically, um, we were lucky because we were deployed to these uh, countries. But the, in other countries uh, with more sensitive issues about political affairs, uh, we would have required a lot of political support from diplomats. Having said that, I can rely on my experience uh, being in the UK and uh, uh, before and after the Brexit referendum. And OK, uh, the Brexit referendum had a result I did, wasn't uh, in favor of, and per perhaps my, my country wasn't either. But we had to find a common place because we had to respect the democratic decision undertaken by the UK. So before Brexit uh, or after the referendum, uh, we changed dramatically the, the type of activities that we undertook and uh, we actually saw a different willingness or a different, uh, I mean, it was like the topic was no longer building up collaborations, but it was how are we going to get out of this situation uh, and uh, how we can ensure bridges of collaboration after Brexit for uh, the UK to keep continuing collaborating with uh, the European Union or with Spain. And also, what are the interests of Spanish scientists working in the UK? How from the Spanish embassy we could, I don't know, support the Spanish citizens, regardless of whether they were scientists or not, in all this process of Brexit. But uh, as I said, uh, this is a very sensitive scenario where you need to understand that scientific interests are not the only ones at stake and you need to liaise with political interest a lot. Yes, and that's one reason why I was uh, very eager to invite uh, Rasmus Bertelsen here uh, at our Warsaw Science Diplomacy School. Rasmus uh, and organized an entire day on risks, safety and security for the science diplomat because there are risks at, at uh, many levels. Uh, both for you know the national objectives and uh, sometimes also for the the individual uh, being pressed into into an unfamiliar context with perhaps many more underlying currents of interests and uh, objectives than are obvious on the surface. Thank you, Atassas, for your your comment about uh, respecting different views. It joins what uh, Guillermo said about having to listen. Uh, Neil, you have uh, asked a very, very, very wide open question, which we shall not answer <laughs> right now. And um, uh, I just want to point you to the policy briefs which have been developed by S4D4C and which will be soon coming out uh, from inside. You can also go to the inside website and uh, listen to the webinars that we organized on many uh, dimensions of um, science diplomatic response to the COVID crisis. Let us go on now. Um, Stella, if you want to give me my slide pack number two. Thank you. Thanks very much, Guillermo and Lorenzo. We'll come back to you in the breakouts. And um, Stella has several things to do, both to give me my slide pack number two and also to make Adrienne, uh, Antonino and Rasmus into potential presenters. Um, we will be we will be going soon to, to Adrienne Sips from uh, RIVM in Holland, whose everyday job is about making a link between uh, nanoscientists and regulators, and she's also had some of these larger uh, governmental uh, dimension uh, missions. Um, 
I've asked uh, a lot of impossible things of, of my friends and speakers, uh, Adrienne and then Antonino Puglisi, who uh, will tell us more about his own unexpected journey as a scientist uh, crossing borders. I've asked each of them to speak for just five minutes in a, in a personal way, once again, about the particular pathways they've taken. And then I'll be asking Rasmus Bertelsen from Inside to uh, step back and give us a political science uh, point of view. And Rasmus, I'll say that um, uh, 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 we were wondering, you know, shall we get into the politically un incorrect? Shall we get into the darker side? I'm thinking that uh, Guillermo and, and the questions and the discussion we've just had have been very clear about the issues of, uh, uh, you know, finding common ground in interest. I would say that you can be a little bit uh, less politically correct than we were sort of planning, if needed, when you make your 10 minute talk. So I'd like to give the floor now to Adrienne. Stella, if you can uh, fire up her slides. So Adrienne has not supplied us any slides. So oh, yes, yes, she yes, has. Oh, my, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. I sent them, uh, yes, a week ago, 10 days ago. Shall I bring them up in my um, my panel then? Uh, if you if you can upload them, yes, I have not received them. Sorry about this. Okay, sorry. Let's, uh, uh, on let's... the other hand, I have Antonino's slides. Mm -hmm. Should I put uh, Antonino's slides? I'm I'm going to try to make my screen work now. If I can remember what you've said about how to make my screen work, um, I take uh, uh, screen sharing. Mm -hmm. I open in browser. Yeah. Uh, an application window, and this one I'll share. And I hope that this is good for Adrienne. Please, Adrienne, just tell me. Uh, if you can see this and tell me when I should go from slide to slide, please. Yes, I can see them and I hope you all can see and hear me. Um, well, uh, thank you. I want to say something from the perspective of innovation and safety and uh, that in, in relation to science diplomacy. Uh, I, I must say that science diplomacy wasn't a familiar wording for me uh, before you invited me, Claire, for this uh, <laughs> session. But uh, it also triggered me very much uh, to know more about it. So uh, I think that that is the good thing about these gatherings and these meetings, just to, to raise awareness uh, for, for these uh, developments. May I have the next slide, sir, please? Um, and, and you can press the button, I think, three times, and then we have all the text uh, that is uh, on the... Yes, thank you. Um, what what I notice is, uh, and and most of you I think are, are uh, already knowing me from from other nano uh, safety uh, projects, um, and and my goal is always to to connect to what is going on in innovation and how can we connect uh, from the safety world to this uh, innovation world, and uh, what is for from my perspective really changing in the forthcoming years is that now. Um, these, these societal goals, these societal challenges, like Lorenzo already mentioned from uh, the SDGs, but also the, the very clear European ambitions to, to support this with all kinds of strategies like the, the chemical uh, strategy or uh, strategies uh, concerning plastic pollution or energy transition, digitalization, well, name it. Um, put even more pressure uh, to that. And um, also, of course, in, in, on top of that, we also have uh, the COVID crisis, which asks for resilience and preparedness. And, you know, it's all nice wordings and we all work very hard, but what can we do to it? And is it something we can do alone as, as, a, as an honor safety cluster, for example? Um, what you also see is that it's not only a policy goal, but there's also a societal demand uh, behind it, uh, not, uh, let's say, uh, to do a little bit of our uh, utmost best, but even more to that, because uh, we really have to achieve goals by 2030 or by 2050. So there's a really sense of urgency uh, to that. And that poses regulators, uh, well, to some challenges, I would say. 
challenges because innovation is stimulated so fiercely uh, that it's quite difficult to, to keep pace um, with, with that. Um, may I have the next slide, uh, please? Oh, yeah, sorry, uh, here's industry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're also there. And, and I think um, when, when you're working in this environment of, of RRI or a nano safety cluster or know what's going on already in Europe or in other international areas dealing with nano safety, um, then you think, well, the world is big enough and it's already very nice how we can handle this together. But I think we all are aware now that there are these demands from society and that there are things going on in, in technology development and uh, industry uh, trying to grab this and, and putting this into to products. And um, I think um, even also what, what I noticed from, from the, the nano safety cluster is that it's, yeah, let's say difficult enough to to uh, organize everything in our own bubble, but we have to deal with with policy makers, with regulators, with scientists, with industry, with many stakeholders. Um, but so have these people in the other bubbles, like in society, the societal organizations, or the people who are working in in technology development. Um, and I think we all need from each bubbles those ambassadors or those people who try to make the connection. And you can do that on a scientific level. And I think, well, many of us already do that. But it's, of course, also a matter on, uh, well, what is pushed, for example, in, in technology. If we push, for example, battery technology, uh, that might mean that also uh, new materials, like especially nanomaterials, uh, are becoming in focus. Uh, society says, okay, that's that's great because then we can have these electrical vehicles or we can uh, use less fossil fuels. Uh, but in the meantime, we also have to catch up with that because when these nanomaterials are, for example, carbon nanotubes, which are, well, under discussion, then I think it's at least important to, to inform these others, okay, th this is a nice route, but let's do this together because, you know, we, we have to do this in balance. And, um, yeah, I think for that reason, it's, it's uh, important that uh, perhaps we all from each bubble have to act a little bit as, as a diplomat from our own perspectives uh, but from the, the sense uh, like, uh, for example, uh, Lorenzo addressed, um, I think that that needs uh, indeed uh, more this, this more, I would call it formal science diplomacy uh, aspect. And, and that is something which, which needs some further thoughts also, I think, for the, for the nano safety cluster. And may I have the last slide? Um, I, I uh, read uh, the, uh, the paper of Lorenzo, which he uh, referred to already, and then I thought, okay, I, uh, you mentioned to, uh, to me, Claire, for, uh, you, you are uh, a science diplomat, although you're not, not aware of it. And, and I tried to position myself in, in the table on the left side, and I thought, well, uh, it's a bit in the middle, like always, you're not fitting really in one of the, the typical uh, parts of this table. On the other hand, I think uh, I, I've tried to sum up on the right hand side, well, some of the things I do, but I think in essence what I do is I try to uh, express uh, what my colleagues within our IVM or within the safety cluster do um, in respect to nano safety. And I try to translate that and, and bring that to uh, the innovation community and, and try to form these bridges, um, whether that makes me a science diplomat or not, uh, that is, I think, is up to others. But yeah, I think it is something which is feasible for everybody and we should do uh, more than before uh, in, in the forthcoming years because we need to, to address this complexity uh, that is coming ahead uh, by doing these kind of uh, activities. So thank Thanks. you. Great. Okay, thanks. Stella, how do I uh, stop sharing my screen? Is that, is that fine now? Right.
Correct. Thank you so much. Thanks, Stella. And thank you, Stella. Uh, you've been just great <laughs> uh, getting uh, dozens of different slides from so many uh, presenters. Thanks for making everything work today. Adrienne, I think it's uh, really um, uh, interesting and important that you've made a direct link now between uh, science diplomacy, which might be something new that we're trying to raise awareness of and understand today together, and something that all of us are uh, really asked to uh, deal with, and that is RRI, Responsible Research and Innovation. So I think that that's really a way forward, I would say, in uh, the thinking that uh, my colleagues and I can do after this uh, workshop. And uh, we want to write up a, a, a blog article for our EU science diplomacy site. And I think that that's definitely one of the angles we should uh, look into carefully. Thanks, Adrian. So uh, let's uh, pass the floor now over to, to Nino who's going to tell about his unexpected journey. Has Nino uh, become a presenter, Stella? So, Antonino, yeah. you now need to unmute your mic. Sorry, you now need to unmute your microphone. Yeah, all right. Yes. Can you see and hear me now? Yes. Okay, so very good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Antonio Puglisi and I'm a research an Italian research scientist currently based in Austria. Um, yeah, as Claire mentioned today, I'd like to share with you my ordinary, if you want, but yet um, an expert journey, which has seen me transition from um, academia to industry and back to university across uh, four different countries from my native uh, Sicily, where I got my education in chemistry, master's and uh, PhD. I moved to the UK, um, where I did a couple of postdocs, and eventually was hired as a senior scientist in a private company working on an uh, innovative technology for DNA sequencing. I then decided to make a comeback to university on a Marie Curie action in Istanbul, Turkey, um, and eventually came back to Europe a couple of months ago, and I'm currently based at both University in Vienna. I initially set off my journey studying psychodextrins. I'm pretty sure some of you might be familiar with in the nanoscience um, realm. They are uh, donut shaped oligosaccharides, sugary compounds with a range of um, different, very interesting applications. And um, that led me to the hiring into. Um, nanopore technology uh, company in deploying psychodexin for DNA sequencing. Um, that was a very interesting uh, experience professionally and um, that led to the commercialization of uh, handheld DNA sequencing device, which is also currently being used for detecting corona. I eventually decided to make a comeback to university motivated by the fact that psychodexins, which um, I'd become a little bit of an expert in, it seemed to be a promising therapeutic approach in treating a very severe rare genetic disorder called Neiman Peak disease type C. In MPC, there is an overaccumulation of cholesterol into the brain, and I thought to use that expertise that had um, uh, developed in um, trying to solve, give a contribution to solve the, the, the problem. And in order to do that, I um, applied for an individual fellowship in Marie Curie and um, decided to, to choose a host institution in Istanbul, Turkey, with a specific cell uh, skills in advanced polymer chemistry. Um, that gave me not only the possibility to access to an indiv individual and independent grant, but also to, to get exposed to the wider Marie Curie Alumni Association, which is a, it was a great opportunity for me to to strengthen that link, which I've always feel pa felt passionate about between society and science. Uh, in particular, during the years in Turkey as a Marie Curie um, alum alumnum, I team up with a Turkish professor in setting up 
the Turkish chapter of the Marie Curie Alumni Association. There was a great opportunity because um, it enabled me to network and get to know a lot of uh, Turkish researchers and professors. And I was very humbled by the fact that um, when at the time of the establishment of the chapter, they um, asked me to become the co-chair of the Turkish uh, Association, although at the time I was the only non-Turkish member of the Turkish Association, which was quite a humbling and uh, beautiful experience. I got to know quite a lot of the, the culture. I ended up staying four years in Turkey. I learned quite a bit of, the, of Turkish as well, to the point I can express myself. Um, but what I think I've learned uh, most importantly is the, um, from my own personal experience, that once you immerse completely into a culture to that degree, it becomes really impossible to accept any stereotypes or sweeping generalizations about the way we look um, to a culture which is so foreign, so different to ours. Um, in general, the way we look from the West, we look at the East or the Islamic world, or the way we look from Southern Europe to Northern Europe and vice versa. Um, so my personal, my take home message, I'm sure we can develop that into the breakout rooms now, is that um, scientists are called more and more not only to use science as a you know, great power really for, for culture, but also to make space for scientists to learn other languages in the sense of um, not only learn the language of science, which is very important, but also the language of policy and the language of other cultures so that we can fully deploy that um, the science to the benefit of society. So I'll end here my statement and I look forward to having a wider discussion later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Antonina. And I should mention that Antonina is someone who has crossed borders in uh, far beyond uh, uh, typical science uh, questions. Uh, look, look up Antonino online and you'll find some really fascinating ecological uh, engagements. Let's go to Rasmus now. Rasmus, you have the floor uh, for about uh, eight, eight, nine minutes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I do anyway. <laughs> <laughs> good. Um, I expect that somebody will protest if Claire is the only one hearing or seeing me. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, be here this afternoon. It's always very, very uh, inspiring to listen to Lorenzo and my other colleagues who have listened to. And uh, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to, to follow up on what they have been saying. Uh, so I am a professor of international relations. International relations is a subfield of political science, which is, of course, one of the social sciences. And uh, social sciences, political sciences, they deal very much with intergroup relations in society. And these intergroup relations, they can often be very, very competitive, very, very conflictual. So I uh, suspect that my perspective on science diplomacy and many of the things that we've been talking about today, my colleagues have talked a good deal about collaboration uh, and building bridges between societies, that uh, the social science, the political science perspective um, can be quite conflictual and quite competitive. And uh, I realize listening to these interdisciplinary discussions, how much um, social science is often about understanding intergroup conflicts and uh, perhaps contributing to regulate those intergroup conflicts. And that's also a function of science diplomacy. So um, to give some uh, remarks uh, on values and interests across countries, cultures, disciplines and sectors. So please move to the next slide. And perhaps you can, uh, I, see, I see all the slides in the right panel. It takes a bit of space. I don't know if that's the case for others. Uh, a brief introduction to myself. We've heard very, very interesting stories of personal journeys, intellectual journeys, international journeys. Uh, 
I'm a Danish national born in 1975 in Denmark. Uh, I grew up in Iceland. And then, as you can see, I've had the opportunity to study and work uh, different places in Europe, in the United States, and in Japan before my current position as Professor of Northern Studies, Balance Chair in Politics, which basically means Arctic International Relations, at the Arctic University of Norway in uh, Tromsø. And the Arctic University of Norway, that sounds like some kind of Iglo University with polar bears roaming the campus. Uh, we have neither Iglos, and the only polar bears are in Svalbard, where we also have the facilities. But you see some uh, key information about my institution. You can see it's one of the uh, four Norwegian full-range universities. So please move to the next slide. Uh, Lorenzo and others, Lorenzo introduced very well, how to say, the spectrum between diplomats who touch on science and scientists, academics, who touch on diplomacy. And as many uh, young political science students, uh, my, my great dream, my great amb ambition was to become a diplomat. And you probably do not, you, some of you may uh, recognize Yu Thants, the, uh, um, the Secretary General of the UN in this picture, but you probably do not recognize the Scandinavian man speaking. Um, the Scandinavian spe man speaking is Hans Tabor, who was a Danish ambassador to the United Nations in New York and happened to be chairman of the Security Council during the Six-Day War in 1967 between Israel and the Arab countries. And sitting in that chair was probably my ultimate ambition. But I very much wanted to combine academic international relations and diplomacy, uh, and diplomacy. so that's why I pursued a Cambridge PhD and a Harvard postdoc. And uh, after my Harvard postdoc, I was told by the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs that I had become old and strange. And as I tell my students, that's only gone worse since. Um, but today, as a professor of international relations, I do have the opportunity, I think, to engage in diplomacy. So, for example, as a professor of Arct Arctic international relations, I um, I, for example, I have attended what's called the Arctic Security Roundtable of the Munich Security Conference. So the Munich Security Conference, sponsored by the German government, is one of the most important international, uh, international security conferences. And they have, of course, subdivisions, and one is the Arctic Security Roundtable, where I attend as an academic. I have also attended the high-level Arctic meetings of the Russian Federation Security Council. And of course, I attend such events as an academic, and I exchange with high-ranking military officers, high-ranking security officials, etc. So I think that's an example of that um, you can very much contribute to science diplomacy, both from the uh, academic side and also from the diplomatic side. Time flies on interesting questions. Please move to the next slide. Uh, something I emphasize in my own teaching is what I can call transdisciplinary skills, and that's the ability to work across sectors. So work between academia, business, civil society, and government. And I think that has been brought up very much in today's, this afternoon's discussions. Um, and as the red line indicates that, how to say, a university, a research institution can be in one country and a civil society partner, a business partner can be in another country. Um, and that are, um, borders that one has to be able to cross. Please move to the last slide. And then um, something else which I think is very important to keep in mind, it is being able to think and dialogue across 
disciplines. And across what I would call um, the four big systems surrounding uh, mankind, humankind. And I would say that we as humans are surrounded by at least these four systems. That's one way of seeing it. There's, of course, there's a society around us. There's an environment, a nature around us. There's a culture, meaning, identity around us and within us. And there's technology. And these systems also correspond to basically academic disciplines. So society is, of course, the social sciences like economics, political science, sociology, law, etc., nature, various natural science disciplines, culture, questions of archaeology, history, languages, literature, etc., or technology, engineering, or I guess nanotechnology as we're talking about today. And um, earlier today, and just to, to conclude, earlier today, we talked about, so what's the value of a, an academic or scientific background? And I would say the value, an important value, is being able to formulate a question and answer it. But something we all have to be very aware of is that, so I am pretty good at formulating and answer, answering questions about politics or economics. Archaeologists or historians are good at uh, identifying and answering these questions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we have to be very, we probably have to be better at identifying questions outside our own discipline. And then uh, the very final point about interests and values. So as I started saying, society is often very competitive, very conflictual. And that's competing interests. That's often what social sciences is about. Values, that can be tied very much to cultures. And that's, of course, basically the field of humanities. And if we just look at, for example, the question of masks and wearing masks now with the corona pandemic, there, um, there East and West, have quite different views of individuality of the individual and the collective. That in the West, we would wear a mask to protect ourselves, whereas in the East, you are probably wearing a mask to protect the collective from yourself. And these are cultural and value differences that are very important to understand. Thank you very much, and apologies for going a bit over time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rasmus. Uh, I'm going to put into the chat the various links. Um, I hope that this will come into the chat. The links that we have created for uh, breakout groups. Adrienne and uh, Nino, I had originally proposed in our uh, schedule together that you would come back and, and make uh, some response remarks to Rasmus. But I think that uh, let us uh, let us move very quickly into the breakout rooms, if that's uh, agreeable to you. Um, everybody, we have, uh, instead of uh, breaking up this platform into rooms, we have opened up, or we will be opening up in, in a half a second, um, uh, uh, two further platforms. The people who participating today would like to interact further with Adrienne and Lorenzo would stay in this room on this platform to talk about uh, this activity of scientists who carry out government missions to address global challenges and other kinds of challenges. Um, persons who would like to pursue uh, with Rasmus and uh, Guillermo who have uh, experience and, and uh, distance on these questions uh, very certainly of identifying and um, translating interests and values, but who also uh, may be available to chat with you a little bit more about uh, not only um, uh, political um, tensions and, and uh, uh, contexts which have to be faced uh, in science diplomatic roles, uh, but also um, perhaps economic questions, innovation questions, and so forth. And I'll be with uh, Antonino in a third room on the Harvard uh, Zoom platform. 
that's the last link in 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 my chat message. Uh, and we'll be talking um, about uh, cultural crossings because I think Antonina uh, really can can help us all reflect about uh, from a very personal point of view what is what is uh, what is our margin for action? Uh, what does it require of us to 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 cross borders and, and what can we hope to achieve and and create in the world with this? So uh, once again, we uh, you can choose a, a breakout group. I think that um, if all goes well, we'll divide up into three equal groups. I would like to ask you, uh, if you find out that you've clicked on one of these links or that you're staying in this group and that there are 15 or 20 people, please pick another group so that we can uh, divide up into three small groups of, uh, of nine persons each. And I also want to mention that um, uh, in the group with Nino, the, the so-called Harvard Zoom link, um, there is not a telephone audio connection in case any of you is on, on the telephone. I decided to disable that because I've had too many people get huge US phone bills. So you've understood. If you want to uh, talk with Adrienne and Lorenzo, stay here. If you want to talk with Guillermo and Rasmus, uh, choose the US02 web Zoom link. If you want to talk with Nino and myself, choose the Harvard Zoom link, which I'm going to open in, in a second. And uh, let us come back here at about um, 10, past, uh, 10 past five. How about that? That means in, in a little bit more than half an hour. And yes, uh, Stella, thanks uh, in advance for giving back the presenter rights to Adrienne and Lorenzo. Thanks very much. I'm going to open up the Harvard Zoom room now, and I hope all of this works well. One last thing, I do want to say that these breakouts are expected to be quite personal, not just interviewing the speakers. Please come forward with your own reflections, your own ambitions, your own uh, hopes. Okay, I'm checking out. I'm going to open up uh, my uh, Harvard Zoom. So, hello everyone. Uh, as uh, Claire just left for the other room, which she'll be sharing together with Antonino. And as she announced, here we are together with Lorenzo and Adriene. So, if you would like to stay in this group, please stay, but let's try also to visit some of the rest of the groups. And then we can start a discussion. So, Lorenzo and Adriene, let's give us just a couple of more minutes so people can choose the correct room and we will start with the discussion. No problem. Okay, so since now we are 16 people, I'm going to change the mode of the meeting to a meeting, which means that actually everyone now should be able to speak by unmuting their microphones. Cool. If you have any, yes, if you have any issues, please let me know. But the way that you do that is uh, basically by clicking on, uh, by, by raising the hand. And then I'll give you the presenter right. So the way to raise your hand would be just to uh, just to have a look at the um, uh, right corner of the chat box where you can raise your hand. And then I'm going to monitor that and give the rights to people to speak. So do we have a volunteer now who would like to ask their question? In the meantime, uh, if uh, I mean to give them time, uh, I think uh, Adrian and I uh, had the pleasure to exchange some emails prior to this uh, workshop. And actually, in those emails, Adrian was kind enough to already uh, to tell me her doubts about where she would be fitting in the science diploma taxonomy that I presented in that paper. And uh, I would think that uh, she operates as a policy officer within a governmental institution. 
that she doesn't have the, a, a proper mandate on science diplomacy, but from time to time she is engaged uh, in international affairs or bringing together different international actors to the table. In that regard, Adrian would be understood as a, a science diplomat, but in a non-institutionalized role. Uh, in, with that, I want to emphasize that we should not overstretch the concept of science diplomat. Sci uh, I mean, being a diplomat, uh, you need to be sanctioned by one government, by one state actor or something that you are representing uh, the interest of that country. Uh, that is contemplated with the Vienna Convention and so forth. But uh, in the publication I was referring to, I also wanted to give the opportunity for researchers, for policy officers who are not recognized as such actors, but that they could play such roles in a non-institutionalized way. But anyway, anyhow, I think we have some Questions? Well, so far we have not seen any questions. I'm just trying to invite the audience to try to, okay. you know, to give us their, you know, hand raising, but also they can try to unlock their microphone and they can speak with us. In the meantime, uh, maybe perhaps Adriane, do you want to tell us a little bit more about your journey, just to start with the conversation here? Yes, thank you, uh, Stella. I, I think it's, um, um, for me, it's, it's a little bit still of a puzzle, and I think Lorenzo uh, already uh, underlined that. Um, what, um, from a background working at a national institute and working for uh, the, the topic of nano safety, quite uh, in close connection to Dutch policy, it, it is a little bit on, on that line. When do you really represent uh, Dutch policy ambitions uh, through a more scientific level? I think that is not only for me, but for many of my colleagues at, uh, at RIVM, uh, well, every now and then the case. Uh, for example, my colleague uh, Monique Groenewald, uh, she, she's even much more on this policy uh, side than, than I'm working. but. Um, I think it, it has grown over the years that um, there was in, uh, well, uh, about six, seven years ago, a large nanotechnology program in the Netherlands uh, that was called Nano Next NL. It was for, uh, in the end, about 300 million euros, um, let's say, an effort of, uh, well, financed uh, mostly by Dutch government, um, to uh, make nanotechnology that boost for economy and uh, also for uh, national earnings in increasement. But also, of course, to, to make nanotechnology one of the, uh, the high-level topics uh, to, to, well, put it in my words, a little bit show off in, uh, on a global scale or at least on a European scale. Um, but... Um, there was for the first time a kind of uh, awareness, uh, perhaps safety and the discussions around that of nanotechnology, um, well, might, might form a hurdle or a stimulus, but anyway, we need to connect better to that. And uh, by that time, I, I became much more involved, not only in the policy ambitions of certain ministries dealing with nano safety but also with the ambitions uh, of um, the, the, the economic affairs uh, ministry for example or the uh, ministry of education and science and um, then you you notice how important it is that you uh, have let's say not only science diplomacy abroad, if, if that is um, the, the only uh, perspective, but also diplomacy even uh, perhaps within one member state to, to bring these lines together. And what I noticed, for example, was in the Netherlands, and I think that's also on a European level quite often, is that safety policy and innovation policy are separate um, pillars or separate silos that that comes from it that it should be independent because innovation has much more, let's say, this, this economic profit in mind. 
where uh, safety should be uh, driven by other values, uh, of course. But um, yeah, I think in in that respect, it it fueled for me at least, uh, especially driven by the new policies there are, that um, yeah we. That there should be something of a bridge uh, connected to it and to connecting these two. And, and I think that is where I start from my background, from, from more science, but very much related to policies and uh, try to tune to policy ambitions at the European of, or a Dutch level and, and how to make it, uh, I think that was also mentioned in, in the former presentation, how to to tune to to goals perhaps of another how to to make that connection um be realized because if we only speak in terms like we, we should connect that the next question is how and who and uh well what kind of processes do we need to have in place and when it's let's say on a small question it's it's let's say fairly easy to to achieve that but well, the ambitions are very high, and and I think that the questions are very um, well abstract sometimes, and and very large scale. Um, well, then it becomes a really a puzzle. What could be my role as a person? Well, trying to have some of this diplomacy uh, activities, but also how can I help to achieve the goals of others? And I think for Nano, it's in the end that we want to have um, safe innovations that address these, these uh, SDGs or that address uh, certain uh, ambitions, um, well, within the EU and make clear when there are, let's say, uh, not the same ambitions anymore. I think in the end, you know, when you have the, the highest goal, uh, well, we all want to have these uh, safe, um, well, you know, innovative uh, products and, and technologies, uh, well, somewhere it's derailing, I think, and, and that is exactly where you can tune in and look for, okay, where, where do we have uh, perhaps opposite ambitions or where do we have opposite interests or where don't we have any incentives anymore to fuel to those uh, ambitions? So Stella, I have a theory here. So perhaps all the people that are here with us are just people who weren't attending because they didn't require any uh, additional action, like uh, going into a different room. Uh, they are quiet here, sitting and not asking either any question or uh, telling us their doubts or their personal experiences. Uh, yeah, so Dorian, I would be happy to, to prove me uh, otherwise. <laughs> yes, uh, so I would try to prove you otherwise, by the way, because actually I saw, um, for example, Effie who was typing something. That's why I made her a presenter. I'm not sure if she wanted to say something or just wanted to ask something. Uh, I guess also it's um, nearly the end of the day. People are a little bit tired, but here is yeah. again one last call of encouragement for people who are staying here in the room to raise their hand, to try to, 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 to speak with us. I really hope that there are no technical issues. So let us just give them a little bit more time and see if um, someone else would like to speak right now. So, yes, thank Hello. you. <laughs> thank Hello. you very much for this session. Uh, actually, I was uh, beginning to type something and then I <laughs> decided not to do it uh, because probably it was uh, my, my, my personal, very, very personal um, question and uh, it wouldn't um, um, relate to other people. Uh, what I was thinking was that, um, of course, this was a very nice uh, session and we had the opportunity to. Um, to see um, some some cases from the from the side of scientists, uh, to see some um, individual cases um, of what uh, uh, other people have done, and uh, probably some of us can relate to these uh, these stories. 
uh, what I was um, what I would like to know is uh, from from the presenters. Do you uh, believe that this can happen in a more systematic way? Because okay, individuals can can find themselves in these situations, but uh, do, would you um, expect this to to be happening in a more systematic way uh, within um, uh, how can I say within a um, um, within certain institutions that will uh, bring together scientists. Uh, uh, closer to, uh, to, to policy making, um, in something yeah. like that. <laughs> I understand the question, Murphy, and I think it's a really nice one. Uh, I'll step in and Adrian, please uh, compliment on anything I mentioned. Um, so, in order to perform systematic approaches, you need individuals. So. I think that uh, for the last 10 years, science diplomacy has got a lot of traction within the policy arena and also in the scientific fields. And all of a sudden, there are a lot of people interested in science diplomacy or interested also in science advice or how to bring evidence and policy making together. Uh, when you have that uh, culture, uh, that breeding ground, then you will start seeing more and more systematic approaches being undertaken. In my presentation, I actually uh, introduced at least two countries, like the UK and the, uh, Switzerland, which actually they have a really nice science diplomacy strategy uh, with uh, delegates all uh, across the world and having really good uh, goals or for their interests uh, that are undertaken on an annual strategy uh, with uh, different ballot points. I encourage you to go online and search for more information of the Science and Innovation Network and Swiss Next. They are really doing a good job in order to drive competitiveness of the UK and the Swiss science and technology system. But you were right also, there must be more science diplomacy approaches being undertaken by research and academic sector. And I mean universities and research centers. And we have with us today Guillermo, who is uh, uh, the head of the Communication and Public Affairs Unit in a research center. More and more, we should have those kind of units in our research centers and universities. Uh, more, most of the time we see universities relying on professors or senior lecturers to perform duties in international affairs or uh, in science communication, but they really need, require to have professionals in those units that can devote 24 seven or uh, their actual uh, job in doing those duties. We cannot rely on active researchers to perform as uh, chancellors of uh, international affairs uh, without risking them losing their research uh, activity, okay? And uh, of course, for sure, they must have something to do, but uh, I think there is a lot of, uh, uh, there is a big field there to grow for universities and research centers to have more professional staff in these units and specifically some science diplomacy approaches. In this regard, I like to, for instance, mention SDG Bergen. This is from a, a specific department or unit at the University of Bergen in Norway, which uh, simply they gather all the scientific evidence that is produced in this university. And they, their task is to engage with the United Nations in order to present these scientific results in, in the United Nations meetings. That's an example that should be followed by many other universities and research centers. Yeah, if I may add to that, Lorenzo, um, uh, there, there is an example which uh, comes to mind. I was last week, I was invited for the, the what is called the first international workshop um, for nanotechnology for a sustainable future. And um, 
there was from let's say uh, a technician's point or a technical point of view and from i think an entrepreneurial point of view a really impressive uh, lineup uh, people from uh, asia japan um, korea south korea australia the us canada uh, and from europe uh, well especially also the netherlands uh, were um, involved as speakers and uh, let's say i felt a little bit like coincidence but it was because uh, I'm a board member of the Dutch Nano Next NL uh, Society. Uh, that I was also asked about my ideas on on how can you connect to, uh, nano safety in this uh, this story. Um, what was uh, I think very obvious in in that workshop that uh, all of the participating member states uh, had in mind that nanotechnology can offer a lot to, uh, to, to achieve or, or at least to contribute to achieving these uh, SDGs. So there were also specialists on, on monitoring progress for SDGs, for example, uh, were involved. Um, what I did was um, uh, at least making some, call it advertisement, or at least raising awareness for uh, the European on a safety cluster and, and the work they do and just you know, it's it's just the first step on, um, okay, uh, there is a safety cluster and please be aware of what's going on there because there's so much knowledge already and there's also outreach uh, needed to, to each other's communities. But this is just, you know, the, the first uh, step. And um, I think that was also mentioned before, what I noticed is you first have to build on the relationship um, with others and and um learn from each other's worlds and uh so it, it was uh for me quite obvious that people were very much interested in what i had to say and there were very nice uh reactions to my presentation um and they they all were uh, let's say in the same direction like um oh yeah yeah but we see now the connection between the sdgs uh our goals to to come up with very nice innovations um, and and what is going on in in our safety because i mentioned yeah we work also on a safe and sustainable development uh, of nanotechnology itself and not only what can nanotechnology contribute uh, to that but um you know this is just well one activity and i think uh, those kind of things would really make it worthwhile to to extend to more these uh, activities and more uh, structural activities, as you mentioned, uh, on, on a larger scale. And that requires where where can you uh, join efforts and where can you make use of um, member states uh, having the same um, well uh, goals in mind or having the same ambitions to to put this nanotechnology um, uh, as a technology itself uh, um, well high in, in their priority uh, lists. But um, if we don't do that, then I think, and I, I agree with Effie and you, that uh, it becomes not more than every now and then give a presentation and hope for people to, well, somehow uh, pick it up uh, somewhere. But it's, let's say, a an, an, uh, topic that is uh, too too large only for the nano safety cluster and it's too large for nanotechnology community worldwide because that's such a diverse uh, community but if you make it perhaps a topic um, which is much more on the minds of uh, science diplo diplomats then it um, it and, and um, try to um, approach that in a, in a structural way then that could be very uh, helpful and um, it uh, crossed also my mind this example because um, I, I was a bit surprised that it was um, uh, I, I was also and we as, as Nano Next NL board were approached uh, because uh, the Dutch embassy in Canada um, was involved uh, in the organization and had good connections to the university in Canada who was organizing this workshop. So that is, you know, all the bits and pieces coming together uh, there. Thank you very much, Adriane. Uh, I see that we have some action in the chat box. So uh, there is again a, a note from Epi. 
Uh, thank you. It's important to have a list of exemplary cases from universities, research centers, or countries that have SPHA in their priorities. Do you want to comment on that? SD, yeah. So, EFI means SD. Yeah. I'm not sure, is Lorenzo talking, but he's still muted. Oh, sorry. Yes, I was talking, <laughs> elaborating on this question. So yeah, uh, as I mentioned before, the SDG Bergen, uh, I will write in the chat uh, the, ex, uh, the exact uh, link, uh, is a good example of a science diplomacy unit uh, in the University of Bergen, which is trying to bring the scientific evidence that is produced in uh, the Bergen University to the table of the United Nations. And they are uh, also running training workshops and so forth uh, in United Nations summits, which is uh, high impact. I think that if you wonder uh, or if you have a look at different uh, efforts undertaken by scientific research centers and universities because of COVID-19, you will find also some good examples. There are uh, institutes, uh, it comes to my mind, uh, one in Barcelona, IS Global, which is uh, producing very short policy briefs about specific aspects of the disease of uh, COVID-19 to help policymakers and diplomats get familiar with the uh, scientific implications of this disease, but also their political breach. Um, and uh, lastly, well, I would also comment on the role of national academies and scientific uh, associations or professional associations, which also have a say in science diplomacy. The Royal Society uh, of London does a really huge effort in international affairs, providing scientific expertise to uh, foreign governments if required as well. And uh, the National Academy of Sciences in the United States or the AAAS, the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Sciences have also science diplomacy departments or units uh, where they also engage in political discussions, bringing uh, to the table uh, ministries from the United States with international partners or international counterparts. So there, is, there are at least very many different examples Unfortunately, I'm not the right one to mention anything related to nanoscience because I know very little about it, but for sure, maybe Adrienne on her regulatory role would uh, know about certain institutions which undertake good efforts in this regard. Yeah, I, I think um, it is um, important because to distinguish at least that there are, uh, let's say, institutions who work solely on, on the nano safety part. And, and that is, of course, uh, also our sister institutes uh, and, and people working in that context. Um, but there is also a whole uh, array of um, people working on, on the innovation part. Um, and that is, uh, I think, a much larger uh, list of, uh, um, of people and um, universities working there. Um, for example, in the Netherlands, uh, is what I know, is um, the, the University of Twente. Uh, it's, uh, there's an institute called Mesa Plus. Uh, some of you perhaps know uh, them. Um, they're also supporting uh, uh, um, how do you call it? Uh, economic missions uh, to, to other countries, but also very much uh, relating to um, Dutch uh, policy on, well, what's the position of nanotechnology in um, economic uh, efforts from the Netherlands to raise, for example, uh, the, the Dutch earning capacity um what is um well policy goals in that area to achieve and what is the contribution of nanotechnology um if if someone is interested in that i can um, can can have a further uh, look at that or uh, require from my 
other board members uh, uh, some of these uh, names and uh, and institutions and the topics because nanotechnology is of course a very broad uh, domain of application and um, it's it's really uh, a different world whether you are interested in uh, the more uh, health as related aspects or more in uh, the energy or quantum computers ai uh, well there's many topics uh, that relate very much uh, to this Adriana has mentioned something very interesting in her previous uh, intervention, and it's the fact that sometimes when uh, you as a scientist or as a manager, when you engage with another country, you don't think about the contacts and networks that your embassies abroad already have at your disposal if you were to engage with them. That's a really in interesting thing to do. I mean, if you are a nanoscientist and you want to uh, organize a con scientific conference, in a different country where you are based, you may engage with your embassy abroad and uh, ask for advice about locations, but also about networks and, uh, you know, support beyond the academic field. Because obviously, as an academic, you already have a really nice network of uh, researchers and other academics that uh, are your equals and your peers. But if you want to reach farther, that's essential to bring uh, to the table other actors that can help you reach further. Oh, so there is another question Daniela is asking in the chat. What was the biggest surprise in being involved in science diplomacy? Yeah, so I'm a PhD in molecular and cellular biology. Okay, and my dream when I was studying or I, when I was yeah, when I was studying biology and then when I did my PhD was becoming a professor in cancer genomics and so forth. Unfortunately, uh, that dream came, it didn't come true because I had uh, other experiences in my life that made me realize that I was very good uh, as a, an academic researcher, but I was even better at bringing together the worlds of science and policy. And that's how, uh, well, I uh, got to uh, start working at the uh, Spanish Embassy in London uh, back in 2015. I would say that uh, the two uh, best surprises about it is, first, in the embassy I was the only one uh, with an academic background, with a, uh, let's say, with a, a doctorate, with a PhD, and with a, a full experience of being a researcher uh, after 13 years or 14 years of academic research experience. That actually makes you realize you are the science advocate in a, uh, in a institution, the embassy, that may be doing more things in favor of science, but may lack talent and expertise to do so. So I was working at the embassy to actually open a wide portfolio of scientific activities that the embassy wasn't undertaking before because they lacked that talent to, uh, to do it. And that's one surprise that made me realize that science may be losing in certain arenas because there isn't any science advocate in that, play, in that field, in that game. That's why I think we require people with a scientific background to work in parliament, to work in politics, to work in health, in justice, in many different places. We, uh, many times, we focus only on having an uh, academic professorship, and that's fine, that's good, but that's not getting out of the ivory tower. We require people getting out and building bridges so that professors may have bigger impact in other places. Uh, to showcase one impact of my experience at the embassy is that uh, thanks for me being at the Spanish embassy in London, when the royal state visit took place in 2018 or 2017, sorry, the king and queen of Spain came to, to London in an official state visit. Believe me, it's so complicated to get a slot in their busy agenda because you are competing there with trade, with finance, with culture, with uh, the uh, year of Shakespeare and Cervantes. And 
to be able to make two slots for a scientific activity in their busy agenda was a dream come true. So, uh, and lastly, in regards for my experience with S4D4C since 2018, 2019, this is a very interesting project. And we are a, a consortium of 10 partners. There are people uh, from the academic sector, people from the policy sector. And the biggest surprise was launching our S4D4C European Online Science Diplomacy course uh, in May and having more than 4,000 registered users in under two months. That was a full surprise for all of us because we understood there were going to be uh, a certain number of users, but uh, such thousands uh, users, it was uh, way unexpected. So it's a really nice surprise. And finally, we see another question from Ilaria. Do you ever face a failure in your SD experience when your message was not accepted? If, uh, again, I should step in, Adrian, or you want to? OK, so yeah, sure. Uh, when I was working at the embassy, and even now that I am working back in Madrid, uh, in FECIT headquarters, uh, Let's say when you are an academic and you are doing your research, you have a lot of freedom in terms of, OK, I, I write up this project application and I get funding for it and I, I will do whatever I want with that funding. In here, that's not the case. You are working for a public institution and you need to have a lot of green lights from the different chain of command. So you need to build up your negotiation skills but also your, also your persuasion skills to make your superiors believe in the projects and ideas you suggest and, or, and you propose and you need to also liaise with frustration because many times i had a no as an answer and what i did was okay going back and do an exercise of what i how why did I fail in convincing them? And uh, sometimes you understand, well, there's no way I'm going to convince them because there are other interests at stake beyond science. And some other times it's because uh, I didn't uh, present it in the, uh, in the nice way. When you uh, meet up with your ambassador or with uh, your ministry, these people have very little amount of time for you. So you need to be very quick. An elevator pitch is required to get them on board. And if they don't believe in the project, at least that they believe in you. You need to build trust with them so that uh, you get the enough freedom to uh, develop those ideas. Yeah, I, I can add to that, uh, Lorenzo, that I, I fully agree with you. Uh, the, the building of trust is very important, but uh, also uh, what I once learned from, from one of our strategic advisors was uh, to, to, to learn to cope with disappointments. Uh, uh, learn that uh, sometimes, uh, especially in your work, uh, when you work in, in areas where innovation uh, is, is part of your work, uh, you are at a different than, for example, in policy, because policy is more reactive, where you look with uh, these um, uh, well, more technical, logical innovations, for example, f f much further ahead. But I also have learned over the years that it, it's um, also challenging, but to learn about what are the ambitions and the goals uh, the others have to deal with, uh, with and, and that can make, uh, uh, well, to, to, to come to a common ground. And then you can add in, well, and now it's, this is how my project or my idea uh, might, uh, uh, might, might tune and might align with, uh, with your ambitions. And that, well, is, let's say, increasing your goals, but it's not a guarantee <laughs> that, that you will succeed. Great. Uh, I see we are hi. back. Yeah, I think that uh, that uh, we're back. Uh, I, maybe not everyone has rejoined this platform, but uh, uh, it sounds like uh, Lorenzo and Adrian, uh, you spent uh, the last half hour uh, getting interviewed, <laughs> uh, and and we were able to to have a, a kind of a, a, a more roundtable uh, in our rooms. Thank you, thank you so much for for undertaking that. Um, 
Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I want this to be uh, projected while, while we kind of finish up and, and say goodbye. Um, uh, Nino, do you want to say just like a couple of sentences about what your feeling is uh, as you come out of our breakout? Well, I just um, a note to thank you really. And it was really stimulating and uh, gave me a sense of hope and that we're working mm -hmm in the right direction together. And there is a common really feel that um, there is a lot we can do as a scientist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, we talked about an existing platform, for example, we were talking about some huge regional issues and, uh, and, and uh, very significant personal challenges uh, when, when you try to come across borders of, of many different kinds uh, and, and divides. And we were talking about platforms and, and networks that uh, that already exist that can that can help. Uh, um, uh, and, and one of these is the the Marysodovska Curie Alumni Association, or or the entire uh, program, which uh, allows for worldwide uh, peacemaking amongst uh, people and, and scientists of different regions. Um, Adrienne, do you want to say just a word about your feeling at the end of this day? Well, I, I found uh, very interesting, uh, but also very uh, learnful to to hear about um, well the the questions. Also, we had uh, also although we hadn't had this this interactive chat perhaps as uh, as we thought, but also from from the presentations before, um, it is uh, food for thought for me at least, and uh, I I still think that also. Um, it is uh, something for the nano safety cluster uh, food for thought, or, or it should be, because I think um, it was mentioned in our session, um, shouldn't it be a more structural approach in science diplomacy to, to reach for certain ambitions and for certain goals? And I think um, that the, uh, the nano safety cluster was founded, well, more than 10 years ago, I think. and. Um, we have now come to a phase where we also have to demonstrate uh, the worth and the value of it because I think it, it is a, a very valuable uh, cluster to have these people together who have bonded over the years and mm -hmm. have a, already built on this um, well trust and, and relationship. But we also need to outreach or to, to make it... Uh, part of, of a, a more uh, larger goals and which which are in the SDGs or in, in other policy uh, deals uh, um, uh, ambitions and uh, yeah I, I think that that would be very much worthwhile to explore further mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great thank you yeah it's, it seems like this is a day that has really opened a lot of potential avenues uh, Rasmus and uh, if Guillermo is there, we were just wrapping up, just saying goodbye by sharing a couple of sentences about how we feel at the end of the day after your session. Rasmus. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Very interesting and stimulating as always. And uh, in our group, we had people with um, uh, diplomatic experience, national political experience, commercial experience, uh, etc. And it was very interesting to hear these um, these personal experiences with the political and economic uh, context of scientific exchange. Great, great. So you managed to have a good interactive time. Thank you. I want to thank everybody who's who stayed on today. Uh, I hope that, that your curiosity has peaked. I hope that you've seen some of these resources. Um, our uh, Warsaw Science Diplomacy School, which is directed by Rasmus, uh, does not have room for everybody. It's a 24 person, 27 person, can't remember, 28 person uh, week long uh, activity. But uh, hey, if you think that it could be for you, please uh, visit the inside website and uh, 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 see if, if you want to apply. The applications will open up, I think, in uh, February uh, or so of next year. Um, you've seen that uh, Lorenzo's project, S4D4C, has this fantastic MOOC. You can, you can spend uh, about 15 hours really educating yourself about uh, present day and 
science diplomacy mechanisms on, on European and, and, and world level. And you'll see there a couple of historical case studies from inside because we're focused on, on history of science diplomacy. Uh, so if Guillermo is here, I can tell him that we found a lot of science diplomats who are much older than 1898. <laughs> and then, um, Finally, I, I just want to mention that uh, if you're on LinkedIn, um, please come to the EU Science Diplomacy LinkedIn group. Uh, I don't have the, the exact formulation here, but you should be able to find it, EU Science Diplomacy group, uh, open group to be joined and, and you can start networking there. So thanks very much. I do take note that I've also gotten some emails during this session. Uh, with ideas like Adrienne expressed that maybe the nano safety cluster can uh, can you know start looking carefully at these uh, these bridge building uh, reflections uh, to move even farther in the direction that you have uh, opened up together. So thanks so much for for being part of this session. Stella, do you want to finish the NSC training day? Yes, yes. So. Um, yeah, we actually uh, came to the point in which we need to close this very nice, interesting and intensive day. Uh, so uh, just to summarize, uh, this was today we had two parallel rooms um, which were called under the umbrella of the Nano Safety Cluster Training Day. We were in room two, which was uh, called Nano Safety Stakeholder Engagement. There was another room on hands-on training on tools and models related to nano safety. We are very ha uh, happy that you were here with us today where we uh, had a closer look at the ACE Nano tools. Then we had a very nice introduction on uh, nanotechnology regulations and risk governance by uh, our um, colleagues from working group G. And we finished with these very, very inspiring talks from the experts that uh, Claire Mays invited us to talk about science diplomacy. I see here that uh, there are a couple of uh, more resources posted in the chat. And uh, just to wrap up the day, uh, so far uh, in this parallel room today, today we had um, nearly 50, 50 participants in uh, most of the sessions. We are very happy that uh, you expressed so much interest in this uh, session. Uh, we would also plan to make the recordings available and also the presentation slides. So please bear with us and we will communicate with you in the next couple of uh, weeks. Uh, we plan to also share this, um, you know, this information via the nano safety cluster, but also you receive notifications via email. Uh, finally, I wish to thank again to all the presenters. Some of them are not uh, here anymore, but still, thank you very much for these inspiring talks. Thank you also to our colleagues from CEA who were the hosts of uh, the nano safe Congress. Uh, uh, and uh, were so kind to provide us with this platform so we can run the nano safety cluster events. And uh, finally, uh, in order to, to stay tuned about what we plan to do in terms of training and education, you have seen a couple of times a link which, uh, with which you can sign up for, uh, for the nano safety cluster training group, a uh, group on training, communication and education. So uh, sign up there and you'll receive more information for us about our upcoming trainings and other events. And uh, finally, before I close this session, I wish to make a short announcement about the next event that might be of interest to you. And this is the Nanotox Conference 2020, which is the final event of, um, of uh, three projects, uh, Gracious, Patrols, and... Um, and by Rima. So uh, currently we have our um, abstract submissions open until the 30th of November. So uh, we will be very happy to see you there. And uh, this will be another amazing event related to discussions about nano safety, nanotechnologies, and uh, more recent trends about sustainability and safe by design. So with this, I would like to close this uh, interesting day. And um, yes, let's see ourselves again in the next event. Thanks. Thank you, Claire. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks. Bye.